Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Well, I want to begin by sharing some good news with you today. Um, in the Assemblies of God, nationwide, they have made a major change, which has become a historical change for our movement. And it was felt a while ago that there should be <clears throat> young men and or women ministers that were under 40 that should serve in the capacity as presbyter in our country, in all of our districts, so that there's at least one, at least one presbyter that's under 40 to serve with all of us older, but goldies, because that tends to be the tendency, and they felt like there needs to be a change. And so each district uh, had to go on a search to find a young man or woman in their 30s or 20s that would qualify for such a position as, as a presbyter, full-fledged presbyter. That's what I am for the state of Delaware. I represent 12, one of the 12 presbyters for the whole district. I'm happy to be in charge of Delaware, and this Pennsylvania and Delaware is a district. And uh, <clears throat> so that I'm in charge of about 14 churches. Uh, me and our committee and our, state, our board uh, members for about five of our churches. So I worked with five different boards of our churches in the state of Delaware. Plus I'm responsible to help any of the 40 some ministers or more that's in our section. And so with several hundred selections that were available in our district, there was a young man chosen at our Thrive Conference in October earlier this month and had to be voted upon by all the ministers in the, in the district. And your pastor, Pastor Ryan, was voted in as presbyter. <clears throat> Amen. It's kind of neat because now that I'm a presbyter, he's the presbyter, that means we can go to the presbyter meetings together and we're going to flip a coin to see who drives, I guess. And I have a feeling that when I get done driving one time, he's going to volunteer from that point on. I have a feeling. Just uh, from what Aaron, my oldest son, would say about my driving, I think uh, Ryan will probably win out. But it is a privilege today to have the daunting task of representing what is a pastor for here at Calvary. And I want to begin today with Psalm 78, verses 70 through 72. It's a passage of scripture that I've used more than once to install pastors in our state in churches. I love this passage of scripture because I think it, it encapsulates, encapsulates what we do and what we're for as, as pastors. It says in Psalm 78, verse 70 through 72, he chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheep pens. From tending the sheep, he brought him to be the shepherd of his people, Jacob, of Israel, his inheritance. And David shepherded them with integrity of heart, with skillful hands, and that Hebrew there for skillful hands means, and he, he uh, with integrity of heart, with wisdom, it represents wisdom, and he led them. So they're called, they're called, he's taken them, they become his property. David became the property of God to be used from tending sheep now to tending people, to be the shepherd of his people, and to have integrity of heart, to serve with wisdom, and to lead with these qualities. And this is what the ministry is about. The ministry is about people. I'm going to take the word pastor today. You know me, I like acronyms. So I'm going to take the word pastor today and help define for you what a pastor is and what a pastor does, what a ministry team does. A couple things I want to get out of the way is, first of all, I want to start off by simply saying God has blessed this church 
with a wonderful team. Really has. He has. And I want to say that with all the confidence in the world because I worked with them for many years. Some of them for many years I've worked with them. And I can attest to them today. I can bring it to you with full confidence that as I stepped aside at this church and God brought in who he wanted to be the next lead pastor, I can assure you that everything just kept going right on smoothly and flowing exactly the way God has ordained it to be. One day God called this team together. And this is beautiful, but through his sovereignty, through the uniqueness of God, he brought this team together as you have it today. There's not anybody serving on this team but what hasn't but been led by God and felt they were led by God and brought in as they felt God led the church to bring them in. And together he formed this ministry team. Even though they have different styles, different roles, different callings that they have, they have the one call where we come together as one and share in the same cause of being brought to lead the people of God into the work that God has for them. I remember when I was a speaker at Valley Forge University a few years ago and during the chapel, I, I did a message entitled the people degree. <laughs> I said, you're not going to find this degree in your book for a class that you'll take. There's not a college in the country that has in their book of offer of what they offer for classes or degrees. You'll never see a, a degree offer this entitled the people degree. But, but yet at the same time, that's exactly what we've been called to do. We've been called to lead people. We used to have a saying at the team all the time that we are people priority and projects second. People priority, projects second. And with all the things that we had to do, nothing was more important than you, the people. The people were the priority. And then comes the projects and all the other things that fall into place. But it, 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 listen, we've been called to shepherd people, you, the body of Christ, the body of Christ. Outside their own spiritual growth that they're responsible for, we're all responsible for our own spiritual growth, aren't we? We have been called and our primary focus are people, you, the body of Christ. You need to know that. I promise you, with all of my heart, I promise you, after spending many, many hundreds of hours with the team for 40 years, they love people. They love you. And I'm going to just throw this out right now, too, because as a presbyter, you hear a lot, you read a lot, you sit at meetings for hours, and you just take it all in. I'm going to tell you today that since this is a day of appreciation, I want to throw out a big appreciation to the, not only the body of Christ, but to the church board of this church. They are the best you will ever find. The best. The best. Folks, I'm telling you, they are the best you will ever find. Trust me, I can tell you some more stories. God has blessed this church and has for years blessed this church with good boards. And by the way, do you know where those good boards come from? You, the body of Christ. You come to a business meeting, you have the mind of God, and then God uses you to put people in that role of the church. So you see God just... He, he really works, he works hard and he, he drives everything together through everyone doing their part. Every single one of you are as important as the next one setting to you. God bless you for that. Now, let's take the rest of this word pastor and let's kind of look at what pastors do, what ministry team people do. And, uh, I want to just give you a list here, and I've taken every one of these expressions from the Bible, 
Every one of these words are in the Bible, and I could add to it a whole lot more than I'm going to, but you'll get the gist here. I want you to listen to these words, because the following is some of the expressions we have in God's word. Ready? Go into all the world. Grow. Growth. Grew. Added to the church. Spread the gospel. Walk and not faint. Run and not grow weary. Give, ask, seek, knock, always abounding. Does the will of the Father. That's just a few of the expressions that you're going to have in God's word. To sum up for the second word of what we're trying to get across to you right here. But first, before I do, I want to share with you the scripture verse that I put in our yearbook all the way back 48 years ago when I left Bible school. We had our picture and we were supposed to write in our favorite verse. The verse I wrote into, the, my year, into our yearbook, into a, uh, what is now Violet Forge University back then was Northeast Bible, um, is this verse. Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I used that verse for 48 years and I still use that verse. It's my theme verse of my life. Be ye steadfast, always, say always, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. Now, you know what all these words said? All these words had one common thread, and that was this, to advance the kingdom of God. God has called this ministry team together to work with you, to equip you, the body of Christ, to do the work of the ministry in order that we might come to the fullness of the stature of the fullness of Christ, according to Ephesians. That God has called this ministry to advance the church into the kingdom of God. To advance the kingdom of God. God has pulled them out of where they were in life. Put them into this role to help lead this congregation to advance. Remember all those expressions. Everyone was about getting out and getting it done. You ever heard the phrase, get her done? That's what the ministry team is for. The ministry team is out there to get it done. And they work hard every day and every week of the year to get it done, to advance the kingdom of God. Now this is important because God has called the pastor to advance the kingdom. Are you ready for something strong? They don't have a choice. They can't argue with God. It's like that story where this woman tries to get her son to get up and get out, out to get to church on Sunday and says, Mom, I don't want to get up out of bed. She says, Honey, you got to get out of bed. And she comes back five minutes later, he's still in bed. Honey, you got to get out of bed. You got to get to church. I don't want to go to church today. And finally, a third time, she says, Honey, you got to get up and get to church. Says, I don't want to go to church. She says, You have to, or you're the pastor. There just comes a time when you got, you know, we don't get a choice. You do what you do. Why? Ministry team does what they do because God has called them to advance the kingdom of God. To take this church forward. To march this church in triumphant entry into the work of God into this town. God has called this team into this church. He's called you to be a part of this church. That together you can turn this place upside down for God. It's possible. Church, it's possible as you work together as a team. A pastor was called by God. They are called by God to advance. They have no choice. That's their calling. I just read you a bunch of the expressions, and there's many more. He or she does, is, doesn't see her job as a stationary job or as just a, a maintenance job. Yes, we have maintenance. Yes, we need to maintain things. But we have been called to a vision. We've been called to a mission. We've been called to a challenge. And that's to evangelize and to reach the loss. One of the things that Paul told young Timothy was, do the work of an evangelist. Above all things, make sure you do the work of an evangelist. 
That is our job. Uh, in, in fact, to be honest with you, uh, a pastor's a ministry team, it's not a job. It's a call. And it's a 24-hour call. And believe me, it's a 24-hour call. I, I just told that recently to a medical person at an appointment I was at. We got to talking, planting a seed for the kingdom. <laughs> and uh, in our conversation, they were surprised to find out how... How, how long of a week we would work as a minister. I, they, I guess they had that idea that we golf during the week and preach on Sunday, you know? And no, I'm afraid we worked a lot more than that. <laughs> well, it was a good thing. It's what we're called to do. All right, now, not only are we understanding that you are our priority outside of knowing God, not only do we understand that our job is to advance the kingdom of God. That's what God's called us to do. We're also supposed to be spiritual at the same time. We're to be spiritual. I like it here in Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. In those days, the number of disciples were increasing, and there was disagreements in the body of Christ, and the Hebrews and the Jews were against each other, and there were, some were feeling left out and didn't feel like their needs were being met. So uh, he encouraged them, Paul encouraged them to, to bring in leaders of the church so they, they would bring in the board, and they would... They would vote people in to take care of the waiting on tables. And then in verse uh, 4 it said, and we will give our attention to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So the role of, of, the, of the minister in the Bible days was they were going to give themselves to the ministry of the word. That's advance of the kingdom. They're going to give themselves to knowing the word and to the ministry of prayer. So they were going to be busy studying the word, uh, busy knowing the word, uh, busy interpreting the word, busy sharing the word, spending time in prayer, not just for themselves, but praying for others, no doubt. So their life was to be engulfed with the word and to be engulfed in prayer. That was a priority. No, they did all the other things too. That's what they were there to do. Build churches, establish churches, train people, train leaders, lead, witness, etc. But they were to spend time in the word and they were to spend time in prayer. And all that that involves. Because that's a big subject there. And I'm going to share something personal today that I don't think I ever shared while I was here. You knew I did this, but you didn't know how I would necessarily do it. But I'm one of these type of people that when it comes time for devotions, and I'm still this way today. In fact, this week I will have finished reading the Bible through again this year. I'll finish it this week. And uh, uh, for years and years and years, in fact, as far as I, back as I can remember, I only brought three things, four things into my devotion time. I brought in a pen paper, my Bible, and I invited God. That's all I had. I didn't use devotional books. I didn't use me articles. I didn't go online and read some story. The only story I read was the Bible story. I believe that the, if I was going to hear from God, I believe that if I was going to grow in God, I believe if I was going to discover what God's word said, I believe that if I was going to let God lead me and to help me put sermons together for this church, that I'm going to have to hear from God alone and from his word. Now, that doesn't mean I didn't read books. I'm a reader. Readers are leaders. If you aren't reading, you're not leading. I believed in reading. And I read, but what I'm talking about is when it came time for my personal devotions, it was me and God and his word. Because I wanted to hear from God. I didn't want to hear from somebody else what they thought God was saying. I wanted to hear it from God and from the Holy Spirit themselves. And so pastors, you and the ministry team, we have to become spiritual people because to the extent of our spirituality and the extent of the spirituality of the church board and the extent of the spirituality of the church, as goes the spirituality of the leaders, so goes the spirituality of the church. As goes the spirituality of the church, so goes its impact into the community. 
Because people want people who know God. And they can tell if we know God. They can tell by the way we look. They can tell by the way we sound. They can tell by the way we look, by the way we smile. They can tell by the things that we say, how we do it, where we go, where we don't go. They can tell. One of the best witnesses you got right now, one of the best witnesses you got is when you get in that car every Sunday and they see that driveway is empty every Sunday because they know where you are. It's one of the best witnesses you have. Hey, where are you going every, every Sunday? I see 11 o'clock. You're going every. I'm in church, man. It's a testimony. That in itself. It goes way beyond our devotions, though. Is we hear from God, we put it into practice. Amen? Now, because of all this, guess what? Ministry and teams have to always be in training. We're always being trained. We're always being discipled in order that we might train and that we might disciple others. Now, in 2 Timothy 2.15, it says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. A workman who does not need to be shamed and who properly handles the word of truth. In my study, I learned that this meant more than just how much of the Bible I would know. I do believe it meant to know the Bible. I believe that. But there's a key word in here. It says a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who properly handles. A workman who handles. A workman who handles. Those are two different thoughts in one sense. For the workman is someone who doesn't just know the word, but is one who puts the word to work. They are a workman. They live out the word. They carry the word forth. But at the same time that they're carrying the word forth, they handle the truth properly. I believe that meant in what they know. I believe in that's how they know it. I believe in that is how it is, how they are to deliver the truth. They're to handle the truth properly. But it was to be handled not just in speech. It was to be handled not just in what one learned. But I understand what this verse meant, that it meant it was to be handled properly in the way we live. Study to show yourself a workman that needeth not, uh, prove to God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. That we were one who were practice. We train so that we might train others. We teach so that we, we, we were taught so we might teach others. And as we grow in God, we, we, we pass this on to others. Uh, one day, this team is going to be held accountable before God. For everything they taught you, for everything they demonstrated before you are going to answer to God someday. The ministry is one vocation where you have to know a lot. Now, each one of these ministry teamers have their own unique callings. They have their own unique giftings in their areas of ministry. But there's so much more that has to be learned in the ministry. You may have to learn parliamentary law so you conduct meetings. You have to learn to do counseling in every one of these callings they've got because somebody's going to need counseling. They need to understand business principles and their roles that they have in the church. Leadership skills so they're handling things in a proper way. And guess what? They got to know their theology. As they teach and preach and lead, they got to know the theology. They got to be a certain level of financiers, you know? They got to be able to put a budget together and work with fundraising in their departments to help raise money effectively for their ministries. They got to know building laws, they got to know business laws. Believe me, that's Dorothy. You got to know a lot about business today. We are a spiritual business. And uh, they got to be able to put a budget together. They got to know money. They got to know about money. You better hope they know about money. They have to know public speaking. They have to have, have organizational skills. We're going to talk about that later. 
They got to have communication skills because they don't want to turn anybody off. It takes skills. They got to be able to mediate between people that are fighting or families or children or workers. Who knows? Mediation. And if you're married to a camp director for 28 years, you've got to be in productions. <laughs> Trust me. I had to be in all the productions. I think I missed one or two when my wife was leading the, the camp ministry. I had to be in them. I had no choice. If I wasn't in them, I'd never seen her half the time. But this is your ministry team. And there's a whole lot more I've not even said. But this, in, this encompasses what they do. This is all that they've got to learn to do. And to be able to try to handle. So they're always learning. Always in training. Always bettering themselves. Because the responsibility. 2 Timothy 2.2 2 says, And the things that you have heard in me say in the presence of many witnesses in trust to reliable men and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. So what this, what's been entrusted into them, they turn around and they entrust that back to others that they may be able to lead and teach others. Hence where we get our Ephesians that we train the people to do the work of the ministry. And Philippians 4 9 says it this way, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. Put it into practice. The bottom line, church, is that your ministry team is always being trained in order they might, might train. Always being discipled in order that they might disciple. In order that you will be entrusted, that you too will then disciple be discipled, and then disciple others as well. Well, as I mentioned, and this is a big one, but churches, ministry teams, boards have to be organized. Part of being a pastor is being an organized. There used to be a day where if you were considered, if you, if you believed in organization that you weren't spiritual, it really was. It was a time. I remember a time in, in history where it, it, people would think that if you were organized, it wasn't godly. It was of the world to be organized. And it, it, that couldn't be further from the truth. How many times, ministry team, did I say over the years that half of the battle of ministry is organization, is being organized, knowing what you're doing, knowing what you're doing, where you want to go, how you want to get there, what are the goals, what are the aims, what are the steps, what's the vision, what is the process we're going to use, what are the systems we're going to put into place. It takes organization, a lot of organization. God likes organization. God is a God of order. There, there is so much that one needs to be organized. There's nothing that is more detrimental to ministry than to think we can wing it. Can you imagine God telling Noah to build a boat that wouldn't float? He gave him the measurements for that boat. He told him how to build that boat. Why? So it would float. You've got to be organized. They were organized in building the tabernacle. Very specific details. I know it drives you nuts to read the book of Leviticus. I know that. Everybody dreads reading the Bible and the book of Leviticus. I hear it. I hear it. Over the years. Hey, Pastor, I'm reading the Old Testament, but what's this Leviticus book all about? What, all the rules and regulations? And everything? Yeah, that was important to God. God is a God of order. And the book of Numbers, are you kidding me? God's in the numbers? Oh, yeah, God's a statistician. Yeah, that's why we were told there were 3,000 saved on the day of Pentecost. He's a statistician. That's because there was over 5,000 fed and then 3,000 fed. And that's because God's a statistician. It isn't a sin to, bad, to add numbers. It isn't a sin on the day of Pentecost, right? It's not a sin to add up numbers. It's not a sin to be a statistician. God is a statistician. We learn, we grow, we measure things by statistics. A church needs to be organized. So you've got all these things that shows us. And again, there's nothing more harmful and debilitating to the work of God than a winged attitude. You do not have a winged team in this church. You have a team that has purpose, that has vision, 
They're beyond stationary. They are visionaries. Your team is a visionary team. Why? Because they've been called to advance the kingdom of God. And by the way, we always believe, did we not, ministry team? We always believe that in all the planning, in all the organization we would ever do, we used to always say this, everything was changeable. Everything was subject to change by the Holy Spirit. Even down to a service. If the Lord wanted to change things up in a service, so be it. It's his church. Amen? Amen. So everything was subject to the Holy Spirit. All the plans we made, every one we made was subject to the Holy Spirit. Subject to change. Subject to change. Lastly, but not least, a team, ministry team, and a church has to always be ready. I was thinking, what would I use for that last word? I thought all kinds of things. But the one that hit me the most was, we've got to be ready. And there's one word. There's one word that sums it up. Does anybody want to guess? They guessed at 8 o'clock. What is, what is the one thing a pastor should be ready for? Say it out loud if you think you know it. Anything is exact right. Anything. You got to be ready for anything in the ministry. If you're not, you, it will knock you for a loop. You got to be ready for anything. You know, <laughs> I decided to do something one time. For one week, just for kicks, I thought I would go ahead and count how many unplanned things happened in my life in that week. How many? Seven days. I work six days a week, sometimes seven. It all depends on the schedule. Um, if you were in the productions with my wife, with all I had to do, I had to work eight days a week. <laughs> we're still trying to figure that one out. But uh, anyways, I thought I'm going to just keep track of how many unplanned things I'm going to end up doing in a week. This didn't count the planned things, the counseling, the meetings, the studying, the devotions, the family, the grass cutting, the, all of it. Didn't count those. This was above and beyond all planned things that I would do every day of my life. Are you ready for this? In seven days, I had to take care of 101 unplanned things that came up in the course of the week. Now, you have to understand that of that 101 different extra things, it could have been a call to the hospital. It could have been having to skip a meal. It, it could have been a two, three-hour emergency. It could have been. And it could have been no more than just a, a quick phone call from somebody that wanted to say hi from some place, and I would take a few and say hi. So it, 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 it ain't worse from something small to something far Better, 101 in one week's time. Anything can come up in a pastor's life. He has to be, a team member has to be ready for the unplanned, for the hospital calls, for someone's call to visit their home, for emergency counseling, for going to the hospital early, early morning hours to pray for people before surgery or extra meetings, to skip a meal, to pray with someone on the phone who's called, you're ready to relax for the evening, ready to sit down and take it easy and the phone, the emergency call comes in. Or clean up after a tornado. I tell you what, I cried. I cried the day the, the tornado hit here. Brother Cornelius and I were coming back from up north. We had a, I had to do a funeral up north and he drove me. And on the way back, I said, let's go into the church. Let's take a look at the church. We drove by in the church park lot. I was moved to see so many people that had come out to work at the church. I'd never seen that many people at a church working team at one time. This place was packed with people cleaning up the church. God bless you. God bless you for caring for your church, for caring for God's property the way you did. That was very moving. I did. 
I don't know if Cornelius saw, but on the way home, I cried. I said, Lord, this is the most beautiful thing to see so many people come out and deal with this and help our church. Or what about putting out those domestic fires that that are called in? Or to um, be there for all your children's activities. And and, and so much more that we could go into. And oh yes, by the way, with all the hundred interruptions, with all the things that an ministry team member has to do, guess what? On Sunday morning, they're ready to preach. On Sunday morning, they're ready to teach. On Wednesday night, they're ready to teach. They're ready to do their small groups. It's this awesome thing to think that they got all this upon their shoulders, all this responsibility, all that God has called them to do, and yet you find them ready to give you the word, ready to pray for you, ready to serve you, ready to be there for you, ready to help you and to guide you. Thank God for a conscientious team that God has given this church who's there for you, who I guarantee loves you. I know, because I worked with them for 40 years, and I know what to think of you. I want to do something today, because a, a pastor is about people. They are about events in the kingdom. They are about being spiritual. They are about being trained to train They are about being organized. They are ready to go, ready to be, ready to serve what God has called them to do. This is your team. I guarantee you that is your team. But I want to close today with with a declaration that I would like to give to our team and then I would like to give to you before we close in prayer. So if I could just have the ministry team please stand where you are. And uh, because of our social distancing, we'll just keep you right where you are today. But I want to read something to them as a charge to encourage them today. And what I'm going to read, I believe, is who they are. I really do believe it's who they are. I can say that with all the confidence in the world. I believe they are who I'm going to read. Here's what it says. And now a word to you who are elders in the church. I'm an elder and a witness to the sufferings of Christ. And I too will share all his glory when he is revealed in his glory, when he is revealed in the whole world. As a fellow elder, I appeal to you, care for the flock that God has entrusted to you, watch over it willingly and not grudgingly, not for what you can get out of it, but because you are eager to serve God. Don't lord it over the people assigned in your care, but lead them in your own good, as it, by your own good example. And when the great shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of never-ending glory and honor. That's your team. They're here today not to lord it over you, but to serve you. Now, church, I need you to stand because I have a verse for you. This one's a little more scary. I hope you will clap as much as you just did for them for yourself when I read this but I read this with, with fear and trepidation because we live in a time that we don't honor this this is not being properly honored today unfortunately I'm not saying that about you I'm saying that by the church by and large is not practicing this I know by the stats and by the statistics that I read that it's not being practiced. But I believe you're a different congregation. I too can not only attest for that for 40 years, I can attest for what I'm saying to you for 40 years as well. Here it is. Hebrews 13, 17. And I'll explain it. It says, obey your leaders. 
and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men and women who must give an account. They got to account to God someday. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. Now let me qualify what this means. This means that, and look it up and check me out when you get home. Check Pastor Kuhn out. This means that as long as they are being who God has called them to be, the pastors and leaders that God has called them to be, you have an obligation to obey their leadership. Should they fail to do their job, you don't have to obey them because to obey God is better than sacrifice. So they have a huge responsibility to make sure they're leading properly so that you will respect to lead, follow them and let them be the authority over you in the Lord. Under you, in accountability. But over you, in the Lord. Because they're going to give an account of you someday. How they lead you. Does that make sense? Now you can clap. Yeah. See, now you can clap. <laughs> because, because you folks are a good example. You are a good example. You are a good example of that. So we're going to pray. I don't know how I did on time. Have I done good? I did good on time, didn't I? So I can preach another five minutes. I'm joking. Let's, let's go ahead and pray. I'm going to pray for you. Thank you for the honor today to be here. I'm deeply honored to have done this today. I, believe it or not, after four, I've always wanted to preach a message on what is a pastor. And I got to do it today. Thank you, Pastor Ryan, for the invitation to the church board. Father God in heaven, we just thank you for this time today. Lord, we applaud you above all. Because without you, we couldn't be where we are. Without you, we couldn't be who we are. And we have a responsibility, Lord, to submit ourselves and reconsecrate ourselves today. To making sure, Lord, that we understand our calling, why we're here, the purpose we're here for. Lord, I have no doubt. I'm, I am speaking with total confidence today. I have no doubt whatsoever in my heart and mind that this ministry team has been put together by you to help take this church and advance the kingdom of God. And I have no doubt in my mind, but this congregation is behind this team and together with the leadership of this team and the church board, they're going to keep going forward and advancing into this community and the communities throughout the state of Delaware and around the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Lord, continue to bless and anoint this church. God, strengthen this church. Meet the church's needs financially. Lord, this is a hard time right now, and I just pray that you'll reach the, help reach the church, his needs with the finances, Lord, with the workers and serving. And Lord, just restore the church, be able to get back together more than ever, Lord, just like we used to be, and even greater. And Lord, those listening by line today, just continue to bless and strengthen them by your spirit. Lord, we'll be careful to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor that's due unto you today. Thank you, Father, for this team. Thank you, God, for the church board. Thank you, God, for this church. And thank you for the opportunity to have a vision to reach it, this community. And all God's people prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, and we love you. God bless you.